So I once had a conversation with a brilliant senior level engineer at a well-known engineering company in New York City, and he was expressing some frustrations about work in our conversation with something like this. You know, I figured out a way to improve our database performance by 75%. Yeah, wow, that sounds amazing. Yeah, except it's not gonna happen. Weird, is it because it's a lot of work? No, it'd take maybe two weeks to complete. Um, okay, then why not do it? it? Seems like an obvious win, what gives? Yeah, I emailed the head of that team. Uh, I shared my idea with proof that it would work, but they're in the middle of an 18 month project and I didn't get a response. I guess my idea just isn't important enough. Wait, 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 what? Your idea improves database, database performance by 75% across the entire product. It takes two weeks and it is tabled for working on an 18 month project? Yeah, I'm frustrated. Did you ever follow up outside of sending an email? Look man, I did my part. I looked into a hard problem and found a solution and offered it to the relevant team. And at the end of the day, nobody cared, so I'm frustrated. So I like this story for a couple reasons. Uh, first reason, it's relatable. A common sentiment I've heard throughout my career is this idea of, if we only did this one obvious to me thing, things would be so much better. And the second reason, it generates feelings. I find that depending on where you sit organizationally, instinct is to blame either the engineer or the company for this outcome. So I'm not here to talk about blame, and to be honest, I don't really care about the blame part of this story, so instead let's look at the outcomes. Number one, a senior engineer at a company has developed a brilliant idea to dramatically increase product performance at minimal engineering cost. Number two, that idea will not be executed, and as a result, customers will suffer. And number three, that senior engineer feels that their ideas, no matter how brilliant, do not have an impact. So that brings me to what I wanna talk about today. Number one, why does this happen? And number two, what can we do about it? So just for a short introduction, my name is Dan Na, and I'm a staff engineer at Squarespace, where I lead a team called Internationalization Platform out of our headquarters in New York City. Uh, if you haven't heard of Squarespace, we are the best all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence. Websites, domains, online tools, marketing tools, scheduling appointments, we really do it all. You can learn more at squarespace.com. But chances are you have heard of Squarespace because it often feels like we sponsor every podcast ever made. <laughs> If you have no idea what I'm talking about, we were a very early sponsor of some very popular podcasts. It often feels like you can't get through three podcasts without hearing the name Squarespace at least twice. Uh, resources and slides for this talk can be found at talks.danielna.com, and I've linked to that from my Twitter, DXNA. So the title of my talk today is Pushing Through Friction. And what I really like about this talk and why I'm ex excited to speak about this topic today is that I feel like I've been quietly writing the contents of this talk in my head for years. Uh, the path of my career has been varied. I've worked at government contractors, to agencies, to pre-IPO tech companies, to post-IPO tech companies. I felt the pride of shipping a complex and high-impact project to the demoralization of burnout. The one constant at every job I've ever had is that I've spent countless evenings staring at my ceiling, sighing heavily, thinking about how frustrated I am about work, how frustrated I am about friction, and reflecting on those nights has written this talk. <clears throat> so in March of this year, I had a series of tweets that went a little viral in the tech world. Uh, an opinion I find myself repeating in a lot of one-on-ones. The key to getting things done in a mid-sized 100 to 1200 person company, especially one that's grown a lot recently, is your willingness to see things through to the end and internal refusal to be blocked. Often many typical things, practices and policies, were reactionary or arbitrary. There was a sudden need for a policy, so someone made one, maybe without considering the externalities of that decision. If you can build an objective, data-driven case that a thing could be improved or should exist, the onus becomes on you to push it. If your rationale is sound, you have a good shot of it working, but because the status quo is always easier, you will encounter friction. A lot of people throw their hands up at friction on principle. Why doesn't anyone see that this improves everyone's life? And then they stop caring or they burn out. Push through that friction. Slack messages and emails might not work. You might have to go to many people's desks. The more you push through that friction, the more you train that muscle, and the more you empower yourself to get things done. Caveats, you can't be an asshole about it. Those are table stakes. And you must be open to the idea that your rationale is wrong. That is an equally good ending. So today I want to unpack these ideas a bit. For years, battling organizational friction was a source of a lot of personal frustration but I've learned that the willingness to accept and power through friction is the best way for any individual or team to have organizational impact. So I'm gonna split this talk into two sections. 
In the first session, in the first section, I'll discuss what friction is, why it occurs, and how plane crashes are relevant to mid-sized tech companies. And in the second section, I'll give some strategies for overcoming friction, both at the organizational and individual levels. So what am I talking about when I talk about friction? I'm gonna describe a few circumstances and I want you to think about if they've ever happened to you. So say you're working on a task and suddenly you realize that you don't understand a part of it, understand a part of it that touches a system that another team owns. Great, so you hop into their Slack room. Hey team, uh, is this the correct room to ask questions about A? We don't own that anymore. Oh, so who owns it? Nobody. This is friction. <laughs> or what about this other common scenario? Hey team, is this the correct room to ask questions about A? And nobody replies. Here are some other examples of friction you may be familiar with. You get blame a file that's used everywhere and nobody understands it and the person who wrote it left the company five years ago. You begin work to update an old, untouched, but critical part of the code base only to realize there are no tests. Friction is a crossroads you'll hit over and over again where you'll have to decide for yourself if the steps necessary to complete a task are worth it. When there is no convenient answer on how to move forward, when you may have to fix 10 things you are not responsible for to fix the one thing you are responsible for. And friction is not only technical. If you're a manager or you're a team lead, you've likely encountered organizational friction. So for example, <clears throat> you're hiring a lot, but there's no system for onboarding, meaning new hires often feel lost, disengaged, and unhappy. Teams are siloed and planning is not collaborative, meaning teams end up building redundant or non-complementary features. In theory, you value a diverse workplace, but you look around the lunchroom and everyone looks the same. So friction lies within the gap between how things are and how they should be, your reality and your ideal. And friction is all the work it's gonna take to get there. And these situations are really hard. And frankly, given the supply and demand curves of our industry, it's often easier to leave companies than to stay and face these problems. The only catch with that is that you will encounter friction everywhere. So I'm here today to tell you that learning to push through this friction is worth it, not only for your company, but for you. And if you learn to understand the roots of friction and utilize strategies to overcome it, the ability to push through friction will distinguish you from your peers for the rest of your career. <clears throat> so why does friction occur? Uh, friction is never intentional. Nobody sets the explicit goal of designing an organization or a code base that's hard to grok or change. So I've thought about this idea a lot. You know, how do organizations get to a state where it's hard to push through changes? How does friction become normal? And I think a common reason is company growth. So for the sake of argument, I'm gonna create three separate categories of tech companies as a function of their number of employees. Startups which have less than 100 employees, mid-sized companies which have between 100 and 2,000 employees, and large companies which are somewhere between 2,000 and Google. Google has over 100,000 employees. So while friction exists at tech companies of all sizes, I think it's most acutely painful for mid-sized companies. And that transition from startup to mid-sized company is a bigger technical and cultural change than mid-sized to large. And startups operate in a unique state. You're still figuring out your product, your customers, and your market. You're willing to trade long-term technical or operational concerns for sheer development speed. And the team is small and has a lot of shared context, so solving engineering problems often means yelling across a single room to the person who single-handedly built that thing. And so the reason why startups live by mantras like move fast and break things is because breaking things does not matter when you don't have that many users. And then you get traction. In fact, your company starts to do very well, and you need to hire and you need to hire fast. And then one day you look around and you are no longer a startup. You have 500 employees, you have a million paying customers. Congratulations, you have graduated from a startup to a mid-sized company. But you have a different class of problems now. The stakes are a lot higher, and outage quite literally affects millions of people. And all those cut corners, once an asset when the company was small, are now a major liability. And so the success criteria moves from individuals shipping code out the door as fast as they can to teams executing in concert with operational excellence to harness the talent of this massive team of new hires to ship products at a scale that was never previously possible. And the company moves slower. There are more processes and people to navigate, so it takes longer to get things done. So to be clear, I'm not saying that this is bad. I'm saying that this is inevitable. Uh, in fact, it's kind, of, it's kind of a privileged state to be in because 90% of startups fail and you are part of the 10% of startups that make it. But some of this friction is preventable. 
And before I dig into what I'm referring to, I'd like to take a little bit of a detour and talk about something a bit unexpected, aviation safety. So plane crashes are catastrophic events, and the airline industry takes them very seriously. When a plane crash occurs, there are extensive investigations into root causes, including retrieval of the famed black box and audits of audio logs. One root cause that is identified time and again is called the normalization of deviance. So in 2014, the National Transportation Safety Board released a report on the crash of a Gulfstream jet in Bedford, Massachusetts. Without getting too far into details, a highly experienced crew of pilots attempted to take off with something called the gust lock engaged. The aircraft exited the end of the runway and crashed shortly afterwards, killing all aboard. So I don't know anything about piloting an airplane, nor do I know what a gust lock is, but the higher level takeaways around the root causes of this crash are fascinating. Number one, there are five checklists that are required to be run prior to flying. The pilots ran none of them. Pilot interviews and cockpit voice recordings showed afterwards that ignoring these checklists was standard operating procedure. Number two, pilot interviews and voice recordings also showed that mandatory flight control checks were not performed on this flight, nor were they ever performed. Number three, the crew received an alert message indicating that the rudder's load limit had activated, and this is abnormal. The crew saw the alert, they talked about the fact that they saw the alert, and then they did nothing. And four, and perhaps the most damning, the pilot realized the gust lock was engaged and said so verbally several times. At this point, the aircraft had about 5,000 feet of runway remaining, which afforded plenty of time to abort the takeoff. They chose to continue anyway. How does this happen? Was it that these pilots were particularly lazy or callous? No, none of the pilots entered the cockpit that day with the intention to lose their lives. But over time, one ignored checklist became two ignored checklists. Ignoring an alert once turned into ignoring the alert always. And slowly, over time, it became normal to deviate from the guidelines and best practices that were created to keep these pilots safe. And the end result was a preventable disaster. I was introduced to the concept of the normalization of deviance by a blog post written by a programmer named Dan Liu, uh, which I've linked to on this slide. The normalization of deviance is a concept in organizational theory that is often cited in studies analyzing the root causes of catastrophic outcomes. The normalization of deviance is when deviant behavior becomes the norm. So to anyone outside your organization, it's obvious that what you're doing doesn't make sense, but to those inside the organization, it's normal and standard procedure. And what I love about Dan Liu's blog post is he wrote about the normalization of deviance as it applies to software engineering. And he has one anecdote that I think is the best when he talks about what it's often like to onboard at tech companies. New person joins, new person, WTF, 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 WTF. Old person, yeah, we know we're concerned about it. New person, WTF slowly begin to subside and they get used to it, time passes. Second new person joins, WTF, 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 WTF. Original new person, yeah, we know we're concerned about it. This is how I felt when I read this. This is spot freaking on. I felt this way at literally every job I've ever had, and chances are you have too. In fact, I'd like you to ask yourself this question. What are the things that you encounter during your first days or weeks or months at a job that made you sit back and ask, this is how we do this? So I was curious what others had to say. Uh, so I actually crowdsourced responses from people I know who work in tech. More than one person. We don't have a staging environment. Also surprisingly, more than one person. How do we deploy to production? Ask the CTO to do it. I didn't have a one-on-one -on -one with my manager until a year after my start date. And this next one is my favorite. There was a hard limit on how much code we could deploy, so we switched our indentation from spaces to tabs and bought ourselves a few more months. <laughs> these are real life examples. And as ridiculous as some of these are, chances are your company has its own normalization of deviance. Things where a new person would ask, why in the world do we do it this way? And I've often found that when you dig, the answer to that question is because this is how it's always been done. Organizations and processes incur friction slowly. Friction is set by what we decide to let slide when it comes to maintaining best practices. Friction is set by the code we ship without regard for how it will scale or be maintained later. Friction is doing things because that's how we've always done them. It's one seemingly harmless change after the other, but the end result is a system of people and code that is incredibly hard to change. So if I had to summarize what I've talked about so far, friction is an inevitable outcome of company growth, which we can't control. But friction is often made worse by the normalization of deviance, which we can control. And so this brings us to the second half of the talk. 
So now what? We know where friction comes from. What can we do about it? How do we fix it? So let's talk about organizational fixes first. Uh, when it comes to organizational friction, there are short-term and long-term solutions. So in the short term, you can dis institute discrete fixes that provide quick coordination and productivity gains. So the first discrete fix, document single sources of truth and keep them updated. So the most common question at every workplace is, how does blank work? It happens hundreds of times a day. Fill in the blank with literally anything your company does. The deploy pipeline, the JavaScript build, the lunch menu, the vacation policy. So let's answer one of these questions. So let's say you're new and you want to know how the JavaScript build works. So you go to the company wiki and you search for the JavaScript build and the relevant article was last updated in February 2012. So instead you go to the repository that holds the code. You go to the library readme and the only content is to do write readme. So now you have to ask someone for an answer. And every time someone asks a question like this and a response from a human is the only way forward, your company moves slower than it could be moving. I found that the best way to prevent this from happening is to, is to prioritize good documentation practice from the startup projects. Good documentation eliminates, no, eliminates knowledge silos and allows coworkers to find their own answers. So when it, com when it comes to docs, I care about two things. First, that they are a single source of truth. The answer to a question is defined in a single place and all the docs point to that single location. And second, updating the docs is acceptance criteria for shipping new work. So at Squarespace, we're fortunate to have a team of super talented technical writers who sit in our engineering organization. They work with engineering teams to add, update, or delete documentation as necessary. So now when I need an answer, I search our documentation first, which empowers me to find my own answers rather than interrupt a different team. Second discrete fix, adopt processes to vet technology decisions. So imagine this scenario. Say you need to make a global change across a large number of backend services. Uh, it's a relatively simple change. So for example, you need to change something small about logging, like adjusting a namespace or a timestamp. So you need to make the change and redeploy all the code. So you begin to open the repos, and one is written in Java, and one is written in Python, and one is written in OCaml, and one is written in Haskell. One logs to Elk, and one logs to Splunk, and one logs to Disk. One runs on VMs, and one runs on Kubernetes. One is built with Bamboo, and one is built with Jenkins. One is built with Travis, one is built with Drone, and the other is built manually on the command line. At this point, you just want to pack your things and go home. This context switching is a massive source of friction. And every time an engineer must learn a new technology in order to fix a part of a shared system, the velocity of development on that system slows. So the solution here is to institute processes to vet technology decisions. So for example, require engineers to write RFCs, request for comments before they start projects. These RFCs should outline the business case for their work, stakeholders, engineering requirements, and the maintenance plan. This creates the cultural expectation of performing technical due diligence before, as part of project planning and is a great way to enforce engineering consistency. And this slide is an actual screenshot of our RFC template. Other similar processes and practices include architecture review, operability review, on-call rotation, and incident command. And the third and final discrete fix, solicit the WTF of new hires. So let's revisit the onboarding anecdote from Dan Liu's blog post. It may not seem like it, but this first sentence, the first chain of WTFs, is amazingly valuable because if you look below the surface, there's so much embedded in this sentence. Being a new hire is exciting, especially at a fast-growing company. You're excited to try something new. You're excited to work on a product that has a lot of customers. You're excited to learn and build your reputation as someone who has an impact. Nobody in the state of excitement and optimism expects to encounter things that generate this reaction. And when they do, and when they react this way, that's pretty strong validation that their WTF is legit. And for long-tenured employees, it's, it's tempting to dismiss this feedback as annoying or offensive. You know, after all, you're the one who built this company. You're the one who got it to such great product market fit. Who are these new people coming in talking all this smack? But what if instead of smack, it was valuable critique? So instead of sweeping the WTF under the rug with, yeah, we know we're concerned about it, Try something along the lines of, oh yeah, how could this be better? What's missing here? What have you seen work elsewhere? So as an industry, you spend a lot of money and time to hire smart and talented people, and these people have spent years developing their sense of WTF. Give them a way to provide feedback on what those are and use their feedback to make your organization great. In contrast to the short-term fixes, 
the longer term cultural changes are harder to define because culture is more of an amorphous thing. Uh, but as I step through some examples, I think it'll provide a better grasp of what I'm talking about. First long term cultural fix, address hard truths kindly. In 2011, John Banja, a professor from Emory University, published a white paper entitled The Normalization of Deviance in Healthcare Delivery. The paper explores the major causes of the normalization of deviance in hospitals. And when explaining one of his factors, the workers are afraid to speak up. The author has an amazing example that I'm going to quote directly. Dr. Smith's penmanship is frequently illegible, but he becomes very testy and sometimes downright insulting when a nurse asks him to clarify what he's written down. So rather than ask him, the annoyed nurse will proceed to the nurse's station, consult with another nurse or two, and collectively try to decipher Dr. Smith's scrawl. Isn't that shocking? Nobody feels com comfortable confronting this doctor about his penmanship. This doctor has dedicated his life to curing sick people, but because he's sensitive about his handwriting, his patients' lives are at risk. The readability of his notes undermine his entire life's work. What? A freaking waste. It's natural to want to avoid uncomfortable conversations and conflict, but being too avoidant of hard conversations, especially in leadership roles, can have disastrous outcomes. So I once worked on a team focused on a high-impact 24-month project. At times, this meant night and weekend work. There was a lot of internal visibility around this project, and a lot of hopes were riding on a successful completion. So I didn't know this until afterwards, but around month 20, the data around the project had changed. What was once forecasted as an obvious home run was now forecasted to perform poorly. In fact, the numbers were bad enough that it was no longer justifiable to ship the project at all. So I assumed that the decision makers were presented with two bad options. One, continue towards launch for the final four months and accept the likelihood of poor performance, or two, end the project early and throw 20 months of work down the drain. And in the end, they decided to keep the original schedule. We shipped the product four months later, and it performed poorly. And a lot of people, myself included, were extremely disappointed. So I've heard that the decision to launch, despite data to the contrary, had a lot to do with internal optics and a fear of disappointment. To not launch would have been crushing to so many people. And I think there was a real worry that stopping the project that late would result in a lot of employee departures. The ironic thing about the decision to launch anyway is that in the end, a lot of people did end up leaving the company. Not only because the project performed poorly, but as more people found out about the change to the original forecast, they lost confidence in the company's decision making. And I've thought a lot about what could have been done to prevent this outcome. You know, could we have gone with the correct data-driven approach and not disappointed everyone? And I think we could have. And I've concluded that the solution was a series of hard but kind conversations that went something like this. Hey, Dan, uh, I wanted to let you know we've decided to stop the project. What? Why? Do you know how hard we've worked on this? Yeah, we do. I, I, I just want to make a few things clear. Number one, we recognize your team's effort on this. We think you've done amazing work in response to a really hard ask. We also think you've learned a ton, and we know that everything you've learned will only help, help you ship harder and more visible projects moving forward. We are su super proud of all the work you've done. But the data on the project isn't lining up. We miscalculated, and it's our fault, not yours. We received new data that proves our original forecasts were wrong. And instead of having you spend the next four months working on something we don't think will work, we'd rather put you on a project that we think is better positioned for success. Uh, OK. Well, it's a bummer. Can I take some time to process this? I can't say I'm not disappointed. Yeah, absolutely. Take some PTO and get your mind right. We just want to make sure we're honest with you because we value your trust. OK. Well, thanks for letting me know. That would have been an OK ending. The acknowledgment of my work and effort, transparency and ownership around the error and forecast, an expressed concern for my well-being in the midst of the disappointing news, and a plan for moving forward. Being afraid of the optics of a hard but correct decision is the worst reason not to make that decision. And many of the hardest decisions impact people. Companies that succeed are those that can make hard decisions but do whatever is necessary to maintain the dignity of those involved. Next cultural fix. Celebrate the glue work. Our principal software engineer, Tanya Riley, has an amazing conference talk that she's delivered several times over the last year called Being Glue. And so if you go to her website, you can read or watch the talk. In her talk, Tanya discusses some of the nuances of what she calls glue work. Of course, coding is an important skill in a software engineering team, but there are a ton of other skills that we need to bring to work every day. 
skills that can mean the difference between a project that succeeds and one that fails. Like noticing when other people in the team are blocked and helping them out. Or reviewing design documents and noticing what's being hand-waved or what's inconsistent. Or onboarding the new people and making them productive faster. Or improving processes to make customers happy. I call all of this glue work. So the rest of Tanya's presentation provides a real talk perspective on how glue work can sometimes actually be harmful to a person's career and get them overlooked for promotion. And that's because glue work, which is all the very impactful work, exclusive of coding, that helps a team get things done, is often considered non-promotable work. What's striking to me is how much her examples of glue work, on blocking people, document review, assisting with onboard, onboarding, providing, providing mentorship, reduce organizational friction. They all directly address the human problems of scaling teams. And so thus my suggestion is this. Make glue work promotable work. In fact, make glue work mandatory for promotion. Who your company promotes is an implicit validation of your values, and who you promote becomes your culture. If you promote a bunch of people who value and perform glue work, everyone will value and perform glue work. And the end result is a culture that values and celebrates filling in the necessary gaps to ship great software. And finally, the most important goal that underscores all the others, make psychological safety paramount. In February 2016, the New York Times Magazine ran a cover story about Google's quest to, build, to understand their highest performing teams. The study, codenamed Project Aristotle, spanned five years and cost millions of dollars. Google didn't understand why some teams performed really well while others did not. Uh, there were a bunch of hypotheses. Was it the teams with the most seniority? Was it the teams composed mostly of introverts or mostly of extroverts? Was it the teams that ate lunch together most frequently? No. Of all the dynamics they found, the most important predictor of team success was psychological safety. So from the article. Psychological safety is a sense of confidence that the team will not embarrass, reject, or punish someone for speaking up. It describes a team climate characterized by interpersonal trust and mutual respect in which people are comfortable being themselves. So the highest performing teams felt safe to be real with each other. They could bring their whole selves to work and discuss, discuss openly about what was working and what was not. And in the end, that sense of trust meant that they cared about each other and their shared goals, which helped their team ship great work. So I'm not going to provide specific uh, suggestions here, but there are a lot of management books and resources on the internet on how to foster psychological safety, including resources from Google itself. When I work with my own team, I consider psychological safety a north star, and it impacts how we praise, criticize, and hold each other accountable. So those are some good organizational fixes and concerns to be aware of. But what about people? What can individuals do to have an impact in environments where it may feel difficult? So at the individual level, pushing through friction requires a mentality shift. And as part of that mentality shift, I think it's critical to develop your own sense of agency. And I really agree with author Daniel Pink's ideas on our intrinsic motivators, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So your company plays a role in building the structures of accountability and priority that allow you to do your best work, but at the end of the day, you are ultimately accountable to your own self-actualization. Nobody is more responsible for your development than yourself. The best coworkers I've worked with exhibit strong, intrinsic motivation. It's the ability to recognize something as broken, identify alternatives to fix it, and be willing to own and be accountable to its completion, even when it is painful or annoying to do so. So here's a small example of what I'm talking about. Several months ago, I was working with some front-end libraries at work, and I encountered a front-end package called Billing Components. I didn't understand what it was for, so I asked around. Turns out it's the package that contains the UI around checkout. Uh, I'm generally familiar with checkout. It's the UI that allows our customers to purchase plans on Squarespace. So why was the library called Billing Components? Oh, originally we thought we were building a suite of billing components. Over time, it only became checkout. So I mentioned to one of the owners of that package, a coworker named Paul, that the package name didn't make sense anymore, that the disparity between the package name and the package contents would only make the package harder to grok as time went on. And he could have said, you know, it's just a package name. What's the big deal? Because renaming a package for the sake of clarity is objectively annoying. He'd not only have to rename the package, but also the repo and the Git remotes and update documentation. He'd have to republish the package and update all of its consumers. So in short, he'd have to deal with a lot of friction. It'd be easier not to do it, and frankly, none of the implementation details would suffer. It would just have an unintuitive name. 
But to Paul's credit, he took a day and he did it. And now the package is called Checkout UI, and everyone who encounters the package from now on will have a clear, more semantic understanding of what it does. So Paul took the initiative to remove the normalization of deviance here, and he also strengthened his muscle for doing similar work moving forward. Pushing through friction requires you to fight that voice in your head that tells you to settle for a solution that you know isn't good enough, that you know doesn't scale, that you know will deteriorate rather than build the mental model of how the system works. Do you do the right thing even when it's inconvenient? Do you identify and fix the elephant in the room even when it's more pleasant to ignore it? Making the best engineering decision will often have friction. There's often the correct path and the easy path Take the correct path, even if it's hard, because it ultimately leads to better outcomes. So one major caveat that I think is worthy of calling out. The wrong takeaway from this is that I'm advocating for a culture of individual heroism or getting things done at all costs. Far from it. One person operating at a high level does not compare to hundreds of people operating at a high level. And remember that a culture of psychological safety is paramount. When you think something could be better, don't be an asshole about it. Everyone brings a spectrum of experience to the table and nobody goes to work with the intention of doing the wrong thing. Become curious. Ask why things are the way they are. Maybe there's a really good reason and knowing that reason will save you a lot of time. Being toxic in a PR or a meeting frankly means that nobody invites you to another meeting or sends you another PR and both of those outcomes undermine your ability to do your job effectively. You're like the doctor with a bad handwriting and a reputation of toxicity will rightfully follow you throughout your career. So here are some strategies that have helped me personally push through friction. First strategy, have important discussions face to face. As companies grow, people get super busy, especially at higher levels of seniority. So instead of playing email or Slack tag with people, I find that face to face conversations are still the fastest path to a resolution. So for remotes, this means a quick Google Hangout. Uh, in the office, I will often walk directly to people's desks. Second strategy. Get to know other people on other teams and in other orgs. Ping random people for coffee or lunch. You can also set up systems to do this for you. So at Squarespace, you can join Slack rooms that use bots to randomly pair people every two weeks. These casual intros will make it much easier to both get context and have an advocate on other teams. And last strategy. If you have no idea, try it once. As your company grows, you'll sometimes find that you'll outgrow old ways of doing things. And it's a great time to try new ideas. Trying a new idea once will often give you more information about its merits and failures than trying to think through all of its edge cases ahead of time. So don't be blocked by perfect, bias towards action. Do you want a new meeting? Host it once, see how it is. If it can be improved, iterate on it. If it's useless, don't do it again. I wrote this talk because thinking about these things has positively changed how I approach work. As someone who is primarily motivated by wanting to have an impact, I found, myself in this, I found myself in this cycle of hitting friction and getting frustrated and hitting friction and getting frustrated, and it really wasn't healthy and I was starting to burn out. Reading Dan Liu's blog post was a revelation because when you don't have a concept like the normalization of deviance that gives context to slow and unintentional system failures, it's tempting to use convenient and unhealthy explanations like laziness or stupidity and angrily pointing fingers is the path to burning out and becoming the asshole. But now you know about friction and why it exists, and you know it's not about laziness or stupidity at all, but rather the fact that company growth is very hard, and now the work begins. Now it's up to you and the scope of your responsibility to encounter friction and ask, okay, what's the plan? And this is the job. In the scope of your current role, you will face uncomfortable realities and uncomfortable situations Write good documentation, push for best practices, and have honest conversations while valuing, while valuing the integrity of people. Because while it is true that deviant behaviors normalize over time, so do constructive behaviors. Push through friction with optimism and kindness because this is the job. So let's go back to the conversation I was having at the start of this presentation with a senior engineer in the database improvement. Uh, just as a refresher, he is frustrated because he has identified a brilliant fix and it's not being worked on. Look, man, I did my part. I looked into a hard problem and found a solution and offered it to the relevant team. And at the end of the day, nobody cared, so I'm frustrated. Hmm, are you sure that team understands what you're proposing? It doesn't make sense that they wouldn't care. Well, I sent the email, didn't I? How many emails do you get per day? Like, 100. 
Did you try talking to them in person? Did you, did you try writing up a formal RFC that outlined your findings and circulating it for advocates? No. That could be the best way to get this done. You know, that team is probably swamped too. Okay, I'll give it a shot. My friends, this is the job. Thank you very much.